not going to want to miss next week. Next week is going to be a great service for Brad. So I hope you are here. Now, we've talked about Judas Iscariot and the crucifixion. We've talked about Peter and the crucifixion. We've talked about the accusers and the crucifixion. Probably any of us who are here will never forget the service where we talked about Jesus and the crucifixion. That one turned into the, uh, a run-on altar service that went to about 12, 15, 12, 20. It was amazing. It was an awesome time of worship after we talked about Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. We took communion together. Uh, last week, we talked about my life and the crucifixion. How am I going to respond to the crucifixion? What am I going to do with Jesus? Who do I really say he is? And today, I want to talk to you about the disciples, the disciples and the crucifixion. This is kind of a series within a series. We're going verse by verse through the book of Luke. We started in Luke chapter 22 about five weeks ago, and um, now we're going to finish up Luke chapter 24, and then we're going to jump all the way back to nine, chapter 9 and 10. We're going to continue to go through the book. Um, <clears throat> but the disciples. Now, let's just clarify something. Jesus chose 12 disciples, right? Jesus chose 12. They ended up being the apostles. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when we talk about the disciples this morning, though, I'm not just talking about the 12. I'm talking about all of those that were, that were declared followers of Jesus Christ. So the, 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 the crucifixion has happened. The resurrection has happened. Now, how did that impact and how did that move? What, what did the disciples become aware of after the crucifixion? What was it that they saw? What was it that they learned? What was it the revelation they had having seen and been, been there when the crucifixion was going on? First thing is this. Ready? We're already in number one. Hope your pens are ready. Fill this in, will you? Jesus is alive. He's alive. In fact, let's pick it up in verse 8 if you would. We're in Luke chapter 24, verse 8. If you're not there yet, you're never going to get there. So let's just start reading. Here it is. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. Let's stop for just a second. Why is there only 11? Because Judas had already killed himself. He'd already, he was died. Okay, he was died. He was dead. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and others with them who told this to the apostles. But they didn't believe the woman, the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Verse 10. They told this story to the apostles. The fact that the message... Okay, let's, let's just look, look, on, look up here on the, on the stage. We're studying the Gospel of Luke. And Luke um, had... had, had it, it looks like Luke had set out to do what? To find out the truth. What really happened? And so Luke is, is taking, uh, interviewing eyewitnesses, people who were there at that time that saw this and saw that. And he's writing on behalf of this dude named, oh, great Theophilus, the most excellent Theophilus. And you can go back to chapter one, verse one in the first few verses. You can see Luke saying, I'm going to nail this down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail this down. And so the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write this gospel of the facts. This is what happened. And so we get to um, uh, verse 10. And I just want to make a comment that's a little bit about knowing the truth. The fact that the message was carried by women gives credibility and persuasive force to Luke's truthfulness of this account. Because no ancient person making up such a story would have a woman as the official witness. By Jewish law, woman, women could not do so. What are you saying, Scott? This is what I'm saying. Is that even the fact, if, if you know someone or if you've ever struggled, is the Bible really real? Is the resurrection really real? Can I trust the gospel of Luke? Can I trust the New Testament? Let me tell you, if they were going to make this up, they would have never, ever, culturally, 
if they were going to make up a story about the resurrection, they would have never said that a woman, and there's a group of women that found the empty tomb. They would have put a man there right away, just culturally, if they're telling that's the way it would have been. So we know what they're, to the very specific detail, they're laying out the truth of what really happened. Verse 11, apparently Jesus' words about dying and rising again had gone uh, past all of them. Jesus had said several times, I'm going to die. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. But the disciples, verse 11, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to sound to them like nonsense. Think about this. Put yourself in the shoes of the disciples for just a second. The last two days had been spent together in hiding, partly for the protection, partly because they just needed time to grieve. They needed time to pull away. They needed time to process. And imagine the 11 disciples were in that room and they're just, I, 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 we don't see this in the Bible, but I believe that Peter probably at some point just came clean. I mean, you're sitting with your best friends here. And Peter Peter probably said, guys, listen, I just got, I got to tell you. Do you remember when Jesus predicted and prophesied that I was going to deny him? I did. I feel like an idiot. I did the very thing I said I wasn't going to do. But that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it was when I looked and my, my eyes locked with Jesus on that day after I betrayed him. And my, I saw the eyes of our, and he, it was forgiveness. And here I was, the one denying him. Guys, I just feel like, I can't believe I did that. I just got to tell you guys, I want you to know, okay, all right. And after a while, someone probably spoke up because there was an elephant in the room. It's like, does anyone notice someone's missing here? And maybe the, maybe the most, just every, every group of people has one that's just kind of like, what planet are you on? Are you here? Hello? That person said, yeah, where's Judas? Where is that Judas Iscariot? And someone probably spoke up and said, what, uh, it's obvious, isn't it? I mean, you remember in the garden, he went up and kissed Jesus. When Jesus said, when we were, even before that, when we were eating that last meal together, do you remember? He said, someone was going to betray him. It was Judas. And if you haven't heard, we don't know all the details yet. Haven't, haven't heard all the details. Don't know everything, but Judas is dead. He's killed himself. They're in this room. Their Savior, Jesus, their teacher, their Messiah, was teaching them. They were following him. And now Jesus is gone. Peter's betrayed Jesus, and he's feeling like a heel. They all pulled away. Peter was the only one that, that was, it said that he was there. John, perhaps, was there as well. But most of the other disciples, looks like they were out. They were scattered and pulled away. But now they're together in this room. And they, they discover that the one that was among them, that they, whether they liked him or not, one of their people was now not just gone. Judas was not just, he was dead. And he's the one that betrayed their rabbi, their teacher, Jesus. All of this. Feel the weight that was in that room. And then these women. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. There's these angel type guys at the tomb. It was empty. And he said, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, be crucified and on the third day, be rised again. They reminded us of that. And so we remembered it then. It's like, yeah, Jesus did say that. And he's alive. He's not there anymore. And so everyone's just kind of like, oh, oh, these crazy women, crazy women. <laughs> Calm down. But not Peter. Peter finally, I gotta go see. I got to go see this for myself. Did this really happen? Peter, and John's gospel makes, makes it look like there was someone, well, not just, it says there was someone else with them. We can only assume maybe it was even John. And so John and Peter, they're taken off for the tomb, and they see it themselves. Jesus is alive. And John's gospel, chapter 20, verse 6, look on the screen. It gives this account. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. 
Now get this. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head, and the cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Why is this important? The grave clothes. The linen that had been wrapped around Jesus' body. I, I think it was it's the Gospel of John or one of them says that there was these, this linen and there was these spices and all this stuff. It, it weighed up to 75 to 100 pounds of stuff that they were going to put on Jesus. But the way the, 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 the linen was laying there, that, that they had wrapped that body in, the way it was, it, that what they're saying in the Gospels is, is it's as, if, as if Jesus' body just right through it. I mean, if you think about the old uh, mystery shows and movies where they took the chalk, like the dead bodies on the ground, and they took the chalk and they drew around. That's where the body was. Now you can move it. And you know, that who's, who killed, who's the murderer, whatever. <clears throat> they didn't have to do that with Jesus' body. Because what, what Scripture's saying is right there, it, the grave clothes were just, they were right there where his body was. <laughs> And, and uh, uh, the cloth was folded up, that, uh, the, the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head, it was folded up. It was right there. The headpiece was rolled up separately from the other. Why is this important? It's important because of this. If someone really robbed the body of our Lord and Savior, if somebody, if it, if it was a grave robber that went in there and said, okay, I'm just going to take care of this Guys, and he went in there. He's not gonna do. He's not even gonna be able to do everything that that scripture explains what it looked like. And I know this is gross, but just think about it. There's a there's a dead body, and if if there really was the grave clothes were off, which they found in there, there would have been blood or dripping of blood or something. Even if they drugged the body or tried to lift the body, there somewhere somehow there would have been something that would have been evidence. That, that somebody stole the body. But why wasn't there any evidence? Because Jesus is alive. He, he rose again. And there was no grave. There was no grave clothes. There was no headdress. There was nothing that could stop our Savior from rising again. And the disciples were beginning to understand that. How did the crucifixion affect the disciples? They began to understand Jesus is alive. Look at verse 13 now on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Stop for a second. I don't have a map. I'm sorry. They, they don't know exactly where Emmaus was. Some say it was south. Um, as I, I'm just looking at a map in my head. Um, uh, I would say it was probably to the west. Fact of the matter, it was seven miles away. Okay, let's keep going. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Now jump to verse 30, because over the next few verses uh, on this walk, they begin to lay out, well, this is what happened. Jesus is, uh, is, is, and they talk about everything that just happened. Now let's get to verse 30. After they had invited Jesus to kind of hang out and have a meal with him, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, and he broke it, began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Look at verse 36 now. So those two that were on the road to Emmaus went and reported this to the disciples. So verse 36, while they were still talking about this, they were explaining, this is what happened. We saw this guy. It turns out it was Jesus. It was amazing. He ate with us, and our hearts were burning because the word was so powerful as he explained it. And they're saying all this in verse 36. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, and so now these two on the road to Emmaus join in with the disciples, and Jesus appears to all of them. He says, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw Casper the friendly ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It's I, myself. Touch me. See me. I'm, I'm right here before you. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. If Jesus rises from the dead, I think maybe we could find something a little more delicious than a broiled fish. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, but that's what they had, so they gave it to him. And he took it and he ate it. Jesus ate it. 
Ghosts don't eat food, at least as far as I know. I'm no ghostiologist, but at the same time, he ate it in front of them. Why? Because he's real. He really was alive. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Jesus is alive. Let me just tell you something. Some people believe in the swoon theory. Swoon. They believe that Jesus just kind of passed out. And then they stuck him in the grave. And then somehow he made it through three days. <laughs> and he got all medicated up and he got all these. And he just came back. Oh, well, that was a good nap. Now how am I going to get out of this tomb? I know. And, and, and he somehow pushed that stone all by. I mean, some people believe just in that, that and I'm just going to tell you, wrong. Um, I don't have time to go into this, but Jesus was dead. Not nearly dead, not almost dead, completely dead. He was dead. And God the Father raised him from the dead. He said, touch my hands, touch my feet. Check this out. He ate a piece of food. And what the fact uh, of the matter is, 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 is he's just, it, um, in front of the disciples here, he's showing them, I'm the real thing. I'm the same one that you just saw on the cross. Sin has been defeated. You think about what is the fact? What does this mean then for the disciples? How does the fact that Jesus died and rose again, what does this impact the disciples? And what does it mean for us? What it means is that sin and death has been defeated, right? Sin is not victorious. Death is not victorious. Jesus is victorious. And Romans chapter 6, verse 7, For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we also live with him. We're sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Jesus died for my sins. He took care of my sins. They've been dealt with. They've been dealt with Romans 6 23 for the wages of my sin is death I deserve spiritual death I deserve because of my sin the 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 the, um the future of my life looks like spiritual death and eternity in a Christless hell that's the wages of my sin but Jesus stepped in and he died and he rose again and he made a way but the gift of God the gift of God the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord aren't you thankful for that today the disciples figured this out the disciples knew this now Jesus is alive. I'm set free from the power of sin. In fact, let me just encourage you with something practical, and then we're going to go to number two. Here's the deal. The next time you're tempted to sin, the next time you're tempted to think something, do something, act in a way, let me just encourage you. Just remind yourself of the Scripture. Can you go back to the Scripture before this? Romans chapter 6, for when we die with Christ, we are set free from the power of sin. You just declare, I am set free from the power of sin. I am set free from the power of sin. Just remind yourself, remind the enemy, remind the Lord, remind everyone in that room with you. I am set free from the power of sin. Why? Because Jesus Christ died and he rose again and he took care of my sin issue. I don't have to give in to this sin. I don't have to give in to this temptation. I can stand up against it. And, and, and say, no, I refuse. Number two, second thing that the disciples learned, they figured out after the crucifixion is this, the Bible is true. I want you to think about something here. I, 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 I didn't, I'm, myself, I was studying this week. I don't even remember which commentary it was, but I, I ran across this. I, thought, I never thought about that. But this area of Galilee, they were very Jewish, <laughs> And they were very um, studious in their Judaism. And so um, just think about the disciples. Think about all of uh, the disciples, the apostles, and everyone. Um, they, were, they, were, they were probably, uh, not probably, they were. They were trained. They were raised in a Jewish culture. And so what that means is that um, they had the first five books of the Old Testament. That's called the Pentateuch or the Torah, right? They had those books. They also had many of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. They also had the other wisdom literature, and the, the Proverbs, the Psalms. The Psalms was like their hymnal. 
And so, and so they had the Psalms and the Proverbs and Song of Psalms. They had these other books that were also a part of their learning. And so I want you to get something. These weren't just religious people in a sense of they were Jew by name only. Most of these people in the area of Galilee were very Jewish Jews. <laughs> they, they embraced it. They taught their kids this. They lived it. They had great, strong families. They had great communities of faith. They had a, a great, great synagogues where we read about what happened in their synagogues where there was debate and discussion going back and forth. Scott, why do you say this? Well, here's the deal. They knew the scripture. They knew the Old Testament. And this is how they knew to look for the Messiah. They understood the word, the Old Testament word of God. And they knew to, but where their struggle was, was to connect the dots. That everything that was written in the Old Testament was pointing to who? Jesus. I, when I talk about Jesus, I always point this way. I'm sorry, it's no, no it's, but you guys are very spiritual over here. Jesus. So everything that was written, and you've heard me say this before, you read the Old Testament, read it. Don't bypass the Old Testament, read it. But when you read the Old Testament, always think of what? Think of the New Testament as you're reading it. Think about the New Testament fulfillment. Think about Jesus as you're reading the Old Testament because that's what it was written, pointing to the fact that Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. So what does this have to do with the disciples? Well, let's, let's go back to verse uh, 15, Luke 24, 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. And, but they were kept from recognizing him. Verse 17. What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named uh, Cleopas asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in, in these days? And Jesus is like, uh, What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Now jump over to verse 25. Let me just say something real quick. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about uh, Cleopas. We don't know a whole lot about him. I think we can probably discern that he was, he was one of the disciples, not the 12 or 11 now, but he was a follower of Christ in, in some way. But as we jump over to verse 25, he said to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Let's stop right there for a second. If you're in a life group that's going to uh, meet tonight or this week, um, uh, you're going to be discussing that. Is Jesus being too hard on them? I mean, did Jesus really need to lay into those people? Is, uh, it's not really fair of you, Jesus. Was, you're going to discuss that and dive deeper into that tonight. Let's keep going. Verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What does that mean? Oh, think about this. What Jesus did is he began to teach them that, listen, the Bible is true, and it's full of truth. Because he, he probably went all the way back, even earlier than Genesis chapter 22, but he went back to Genesis, I'm sure. And he probably went to Joseph in the story in jo Genesis 22, 18, where um, the angel of the Lord began to explain things to Abram, Abraham and, and said this, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The offspring that would bless the nations ultimately refers to who? Jesus Christ. So it's very likely that as Jesus is, is here explaining these things on the road to Emmaus, guys, remember in Genesis, you studied that. You probably even memorized it. It's in the Torah. And when Joseph was, was, was having this interaction with the angel and saying that his offspring is going to bless all. It's me. I'm the Messiah. I'm the fulfillment of that. He may have taken him to the, the book of Psalms. This is all I'm just conjecturing here. What, 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 what would, it, would have he, he may have taken him to the book of Psalms in chapter 22, verse 1, and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. And he may have even said, guys, do you remember? I said those words on the cross. That was prophesying the very words that I was going to say just a few days ago. Do you remember that, guys? 
He probably took him to Isaiah chapter 53 and explained portions like verse 4. Surely he took our, our infirmities and carried our sorrow, sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Why? He's saying, listen, disciples, listen. On the road to Emmaus, listen. The word of God is true. The Bible is true. And all of a sudden, it began to, they began to connect the dots. It's like, whoa, yeah. In fact, they get to the point in verse 32, they ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? Since I'm there, let's just throw this out. When was the last time you heard a message from the word? You spent some time reading the word yourself, and you're like, whoa. I can't, that was so powerful. Where God just spoke so clearly to you from the word of God. Do you know that's the power of the word of God? He did it later. It talks about it in verse 28. Um, now let's, let's just jump to verse 44. Look at verse 44. He said to the disciples, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. And where? In the law of Moses, the Old Testament, the prophets, and the Psalms. So Jesus was trying to tell the disciples through the crucifixion and the resurrection, listen, this is, I just want to prove to you now, the word of God is true. The Bible is true. Were not our hearts burning, burning within us when he was talking to us? Hmm. Do we understand the power of Scripture? The Bible, it's not just a book of good moral teaching it's not, a, not just a, a good book of morality. It's alive. Hebrews chapter 4. Remember this one? Hebrews 4.12. Though For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. The power of the word. Singing about this this week. When Jesus was tempted, do you remember studying Luke chapter 4? In Luke chapter 4, we were studying about when Jesus was tempted in the desert, Right? And it records three temptations that the devil threw at him. And I think there were more temptations thrown at him, but those are the only three that are recorded. But how did Jesus respond? With Scripture. He said, it is written, blah, 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 blah. It is written, blah, blah, blah. Whatever, whatever verse that is. And I just had this thought, and I believe it was from the Holy Spirit. Well, I know it was. This week as I was just thinking about that. He wasn't just using Scripture as a magic word. What I'm getting ready to tell you right now could be a real revelation and breakthrough through some of you, for some of you who are struggling because you're like, you know, I'm a word person, Scott. I take scriptures and I pray them and I speak them and when I'm in a situation, I'm just a... Do you have the word here or do you have it here? And when I say that, I mean like, there's one, one thing. Jesus, when he's quoting those scriptures, he's quoting not just a magic potion or a magic word. He's quoting scripture that's coming from a deep-seated understanding that this is truth. It is written. I believe it down deep in my soul, in my heart. I think it's great to memorize scripture. Absolutely. But let's make sure as we're memorizing it that we're not just memorizing it uh, like we would a, uh, uh, for a test at school. <laughs> I just need this information, information, information. Let it get past the information and let it begin to grow deep inside of your heart. What are you talking about, Scott? Well, let me just give you a, another thought. So Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13, for most of my life, has been kind of a life verse. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength or who strengthens me. Now, that's one thing to just, man, that's, I'm going to put that on my shirt. I'm going to write that on the back of my, I'm going to write, I'm going to put it on my phone. I'm going to bring it up on my phone every day. In fact, I'm going to have, it's going to read me every morning. And, and when I'm brushing my teeth, I've got Sonicare. It vibrates a thousand times a second, probably. Clean teeth. Every time I'm, I'm, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm going to have, 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't do it as good as the guy on the Bible app can. But, uh, uh, and I don't have an English accent, so it's just thrown there. But I, I, could have it, I could have it on my phone. I could, have, I could paste it on the mirror. I could put it on the mirror of my car. I could put it everywhere. But if it's all just head knowledge, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it never gets deep into my spirit, into my heart, into my soul, and really believe it. I'm, I'm, I'm missing something. Let me explain it further. Because when, when you're 16 years of, of age and, and your family suddenly is, is just completely changed and you face the tragedy of your lifetime, then suddenly you, you are faced with, is this just something I'm going to believe up here or am I going to hold on to it deep down inside that, yeah, you know what? I can face this. I'm going to be okay because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. When you're walking down the aisle or your wife is walking down the aisle and you're standing there thinking, am I ready for this? Should I? I, I, I God, I, can I really be the husband that this woman needs? Can I provide for a family? Am I ready for this at the age of 20 years old? I can't. We went to a honeymoon in Hawaii, I couldn't even legally rent a car. They had to do some things and twist some things around in Hawaii just so I could rent a car. I'm 20 years old. Should I rent? And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I believe God will give me the strength to do what he's leading me to do. I'm trusting you, Lord. Well, I'm, 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 we're starting to have kids, and, and we, we had three beautiful daughters. And, and as you're starting to have these kids, you're like, God, ah, they're girls, Lord. I love them to death. But I don't know how to, I'm not a girl, Lord. I, I, uh, now, I did have the benefit. I had three older sisters. I was the baby. I was the favorite. <laughs> well, at least I like to think so. But I, 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 I'm so blessed with my girls. But I would be lying to you if I would say to you that there aren't times where I'm just like, God, I can't do this. And then all of a sudden, it comes in my heart and my spirit. I can do this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not just up here. It's deep down in my, I know we're going to be all right. When God calls us to Middlebury and says, start a church. And it's that first Sunday, December 3rd of 2000. And we knew that we had about 13 people, eight adults and five kids that were going to be there on that first Sunday, December 3rd of 2000. But we had no idea who else was going to be there. We didn't know if anyone was going to even show up. What kept me going is the fact that I'm not doing this on my own. I'm not doing this for my own glory. I'm not doing this so people can, hey, look at Scott. Came back to his hometown and started a church. No, it's not about little Scotty growing up and starting a church. It's about Jesus Christ and him, his word being preached and being delivered and set out into the community. And you know what kept me going? It wasn't just a head knowledge that, oh, bless God, I'm going to put this on my shirt. I can do all things. No, it's a deep-seated understanding that I know I can do this through Christ who gives me strength. You see the difference? For some of you, you look at Scripture as a magic potion. Alakazam, alakadoodle, woodle. You're just like, I'm just going to pronounce this. You know, give me some pixie dust and just believe. And you, you, you look at Scripture, you just you quote it. Just as, no, it's it's so much more powerful than that. Scott, what does this look like? Well, you've heard me teach this before. Let me just throw this in there. Let the Holy Spirit place a Scripture on your heart. In fact, even before we get there. Ephesians chapter 6, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema or the word of God. What does that mean? That means that whatever season you're in right now, whatever you're facing right now, let me tell you something. God wants to give you a verse for that season. God wants to give you a rhema. You see, all of this is the truth. All of this is the word of God. But the word used here in the original Greek, it gives you this thought, this idea, that whatever you're facing right now, God has a scripture, a verse, that he wants to give you to stand on. Just this week, I was reading in my devotions, and all of a sudden, boom, right out of uh, Exodus, it just jumped out of my, and just jumped into my spirit. It spoke to me about some things that I'm praying about, thinking about, and it just spoke to me. God wants to do that for you. What are you facing right now? You need a word for it. Stand on it. Let the Lord give you. Let the Holy Spirit give you a word. Stand on A scripture to stand on. I'm not talking like an Oprah word, or I'm not talking like a, even a, a self-help word. I'm talking a verse from the Bible and say, okay, God, I believe you're speaking that to my heart, and I'm going to stand on that. I'm not just going to think on it. I'm going to stand on this and believe this. You say, Scott, I, I, I can't think. I don't think I've ever had that happen to me, Scott. I don't know how to do that. You know, that's really what we talked about at the very beginning of the year. 
we're talking about how do I hear the voice of God? How do I hear the direction of God? And so you may go back to the beginning of the year and listen to some of those messages, but can I just tell you, the, the second thing I throw out to you is, so the first thing is, let the Holy Spirit place a scripture in your heart. The second thing is this, choose a scripture until God moves you on. So you're like, Scott, I, I don't know what verse, I, I, I've been reading in my devotions and I read the daily bread and I, you know, I, I ate the whole loaf. I mean, I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't have any, I don't have any scripture that I feel like, but I, I'm walking through some stuff. And so, okay, dealing uh, with, with immorality, then choose Romans 13, 14. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Memorize that one. Hold on to that one. Until the Holy Spirit gives you another one, stay with that one. Uh, I, I have a hard time not slandering people and, and, and blabbing about people. James 4.11's got one for that. Brothers, do not slander one another. That's all the farther you need to go. Just stand on that. I shouldn't be slandering. Brothers, do not slander. I'm gonna hold on to that until God gives me another one. If you're battling worry, there's scriptures on worry. If you're battling health, there's scriptures on health. If you're battling uh, for the salvation of a loved one, there's scriptures on that. If you're battling for your marriage, for your family, there's scriptures on that one. Let the truth of the gospel become more uh, a rhema just coming alive in your spirit and stand on it. This is something the disciples understood. Jesus wanted to make sure Jesus was alive. And disciples, I want you to understand, this is how everything connects together. Jesus said, the word of God is true. Let me show you. Here's how the Old Testament, and this is all that was written. And now here's what's happened here. Do you see the connection? Because the word of God is true. The third thing, write this in your notes. The final thing Jesus said was this. Ooh, everybody needs to know about Jesus. Everybody needs to know about Jesus. You know, verses 45, look at it. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in, the name, in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. It's going to go to all the nations, all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem, what is going to go to the nation? Do you see that? What is going to go to the nations? And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations. Repentance and forgiveness. Repentance and forgiveness. Let me throw out something to you. And this may offend you, and that's okay. <clears throat> Here it is. You may have heard this saying, preach, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Some uh, would uh, um, recommend this quote was uh, given by St. Francis of Assisi. There's a debate on that, but here's one. I understand how great this looks if we're desiring to build our theology from a social media post. And I believe the heart of the saying is understandable. Don't just be a hearer or a spouter of the word of God, but be a doer. James, the book of James, read that. Be a doer of the word. But I'm going to be honest with you. This quote is painful for me to read sometimes because I don't think it's biblical. Here in Luke, Jesus says specifically that we're to preach what when we go to the nations? We're to preach what when we go to our neighborhoods, when we go to our workplaces, when we go to our schools to share the gospel? We're, we're to share the gospel. We're, we're to share Jesus. Repentance and forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission passage, Jesus says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Look on the screen. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey the gospel, the things I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And the gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and Preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. The Gospel of John says, John 20, 21, again Jesus said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. I am sending you, sending you to do what? Preach the Gospel. Preach the message of repentance and forgiveness. 
And I know this is a hot button issue for me. I know you've probably heard me say this before, but you might not understand what I'm saying right now. You might not get the importance of what I'm saying right now, but in a couple weeks, in a couple months, in a couple years, it might dawn on you why Scott was so worked up about that. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, he said, When I came to you, brothers, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified and the gospel message of Jesus Christ. He lived, he died, he rose again, and we need to repent and we need to ask for forgiveness. It's the gospel message that needs to be taken to the ends of the earth. What are the other options? Let me just throw this out to you. You take it. If we go to our neighbors, if we go to our nation, if we go to other nations, what are the other options? Well, the other option is we clothe people, we feed people, we house people, we educate people, we get young ladies uh, and young boys brought out of the sex trade, the brothels of India, of Bangladesh, of Spain, of France, even cities here in the United States. If we do all of that... But we've only, we, we, we don't give them the message of the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. We've only done half the job. I know the scripture says when you give a cup of cold water, you're doing this under the Lord. You, you know, you're ministering. I get that. I get that. But we've got to understand as we send missionaries, as we're a part of our local community, yes, let's serve our face off. Let's serve one another. Let's serve people. Let's love on people. But let's love them enough to tell them the truth. And that's the fact that we've got to have repentance. We've got to have forgiveness through Jesus Christ. In, in other words, for, think about it this way. Jesus was quoting Isaiah in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to what? To preach. Preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I've been reading a book by this gal named Beth Grant. I've known about her for a long time. She's a part of the Assemblies of God. Her and her husband, co-founders of Project Rescue. Here in our area, we know of Destiny Rescue. Project Rescue does that same thing that Destiny Rescue does. Just, um, I think, in a little different way that I'm beginning to think, wow, th- this, is, this is something. And I'm a, I'm a local church guy. You know that. I believe in the local church. And I believe, biblically, the local church is where it all, all ministry ought to start. And any parachurch or outside ministry is only as strong as it connects through and to the local church. The local church is a sending agency. And so sometimes when I hear about um, slave trade and the sexual slave trade and going to the brothels and pulling these girls out and these boys out, out there and rescuing them, I, I just think, okay, how does this connect to the local church? How does, and finally, I'm finding somebody who helps me connect what they're doing with the local church and how they're doing it. You'll hear more about that later. But she, she said something in this book. As, as, as Beth and her husband are so involved in India and other, other nations of, of, of pulling young women and kids and their, their kids out of the, the brothels in these areas, is. And this is what she said in her book, Courageous Compassion, Confronting Social Injustice God's Way. I, I just got to read this to you. The larger and more developed a ministry becomes, whether a university ministry, local church, or nonprofit, the easier it is for the evangelism and discipleship streams of the ministry to become separate from the compassionate stream. If we aren't diligent, the proclaiming dimension of Jesus' Luke 4.18 mandate, preaching the good news, becomes more and more detached from the dimension of proclaiming freedom, healing, and releasing the oppressed. Instead of integration over time and organizational growth, we develop a separate ministries that do specialized parts of what Jesus originally did as an integrated whole. What is that saying, Scott? This is what it's saying, is let's keep it all together. Yes, let's feed the hungry. Yes, let's clothe the naked. Yes, let's educate those who need it. But let's make sure right along with that, we're giving them the gospel message of Jesus Christ who came, lived, and died so they could repent and find forgiveness. We put that all together. And this is the message that Jesus said, disciples, you got a job to do. He said, listen, you got a job to do. You got something right here, right now. You got to preach this message to the nations repentance and forgiveness. Let me encourage you, mom and dad, let it start in your home. Let it start in your home. 
Model forgiveness. Model repentance. And uh, parents, there should never be a culture in your household where your children never hear you even repent of your own sin. We don't want our kids to grow up as religious kids who talk about everyone else's sin, but not their own, because they've never learned that even their mom and dad mess up sometimes. Dads, you want to know how to be the spiritual leader of your home. Learn to repent. When you're wrong, tell the kids, kids, listen, I was wrong on that. I'm sorry. Forgive me. It's powerful because sin leads to death and sin kills marriages. Sin kills families. Sin kills churches. It kills friendships. Sin kills life groups. Sin kills all kinds of relationships. And so let's just decide I'm going to repent and I'm going to ask for forgiveness and allow the Lord to forgive me and set me free. Whether it's the ends of the earth or the ends of your driveway, the disciples, you and I, the all followers of Jesus, we're called to take this message to the ends of the earth. Right now, every week, every month, you guys are given sacrificially to take the gospel to the nations, even here in our own nation. In fact, um, through your missions, faith promises that you're giving over and above your tithe, I just commend you. Thank you so much for catching this vision that I'm talking. I'm preaching to the choir today. But uh, even, even uh, just uh, uh, recently, one of our missionaries that I absolutely love to death, and it's not just because he has a funny name, but Jay Rostifer. Rostifer. Some of you know the, the Rostifers. They've been on Madagascar, not the movie. Um, but the actual island, um, they're on the island and they're evangelizing, training, planting churches all over that island and hit a, a financial shortfall while they've been over there. Sometimes that happens to even the best of missionaries. And who was able to step in there and say, here, here, here you go, here's a couple thousand dollars. It's because you give faithfully to our missions account through your faith promises. We were able to bless them and keep them on the field. And that, the, the last newsletter said, hey, everyone responded, thank you so much, we're good. Hallelujah. Also, uh, this week, there'll be a check go out for $1,000, um, uh, some from our general, some from our missions fund, to go to my friends in, in Lafayette, Indiana, Mount Hope Church. I met their pastor, Brian Courtney, several years ago. But uh, in, I think it was 2011, they started this church. They're, it's a new church plant. They're just now in the place of being able to uh, buy some land. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to take $1,000 and we're going to sow it into their land. We're going to sow it into their ministry and say, hey, God bless you. Go for it. Make it happen. I, I want to see all of Tippecanoe County and all of Lafayette one to Jesus through you and churches like yours. We have a heart to go. But let me, let me bring it home here. What about here? Right here, tomorrow, as you go to school, as you go to work, as, as, as you go throughout your day. What about here? How are we doing? Who are you targeting? I mean, who are you building a relationship with? Who are you trying to share the love of Jesus with? As I was preparing this message the other day, there was an old hymn. I don't know where this even came from. I don't think I've heard this hymn for years. But one of the verses goes, Let this Lord lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I bravely do my part to win that soul for thee. King James English and everything. But what a message. You're like, Scott, I, I don't know. I mean, I, what? Well, listen, it's not rocket science. Who are people that you come into contact with on a regular basis? God put you there to point them to Jesus, to bring the message of repentance and forgiveness to. Let the Lord lay that on your heart. Worship team, would you come? But grab your Bibles. Don't close your Bibles just yet, will you? <clears throat> well, the worship team can, but you can't. Uh, verse 49, will you go there? I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. What's that talking about? Oh, I couldn't skip over that. We're a Pentecostal charismatic church. We can't skip over that verse. You see, the Gospel of John gives further input on what's happening at this point. In fact, look on the screen, John chapter 20, verse 21. Look with me. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. He said it to them again. Because every time Jesus appeared, they're like, whoa. It's like, calm down, peace be with you. Ah, calm down, it's just me again. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And they received the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. What was happening here? Well, listen, prior to this time, follow me just, I know this is the end of the message. I've been preaching for a long time, but just get this. Prior to this, this time, these disciples were technically true believers and followers of Jesus and saved according to the old covenant. 
what was set up in the Old Testament. That's how they were saved. And now Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Did you, do you, do you now or when you were younger, did you have one of those gas oven stove things where the pilot light would come on? And you could even, if you knew where it was, you could feel that part of this, oh, that's hot, because it stayed on all the time. Now, some of the newer ones and the water heaters and stuff, they turn off and it saves gas and all that kind of stuff. But that's a whole other thing. But when you get saved, the Holy Spirit pilot light comes on. You will never be more saved or less saved. You're saved. You're forgiven. When you give your life to Christ, and that's exactly what happened here in John chapter 20. Jesus breathed on them. They were no longer saved by keeping the old covenant. They were now saved by the Holy Spirit coming in and regenerating them. Why is that important? Let me tell you why that's important. Because just a few, uh, few more days later, we see Jesus is telling these same people, the same disciples. Now listen, you're regenerated. Here's the deal. But wait here. In fact, keep reading into the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, he says, wait here. Don't go anywhere. Because I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit on you. It's what Joel prophesied in the, in the last days. You're going you're gonna to prophesy. It's going to be awesome. It's what, what John the Baptist said. Hey, you think I'm all that in a bag of chips? Wait till you see who's coming. Jesus Christ. He, Jesus, he's going to come, and he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It's going to be fireworks. It's going to be amazing. So what's your point, Scott? Well, what some people do is they take the John chapter 20, breath of the Holy Spirit, saved, regeneration thing, and they tie it in with Acts chapter 2 where the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. And I think they're erroneous. There's two works of the Holy Spirit going on here. There's the first work of salvation, regeneration. John chapter 20, Jesus breathed on them. If you're not saved, give your heart to Jesus. There's a second work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus says, and I'm going to pour out my spirit in such a way that you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses. That second work of the Holy Spirit spoke of here at the end and spoke of into Acts chapter 2, chapter 1 and chapter 2, that's an empowering work of the Holy Spirit to empower you for service, to open the door wide open to the 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gifts of the Spirit, wide open for the Holy Spirit to empower you, to empower us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and even to your school and to your workplace. The Holy Spirit wants to empower you. He wants to empower you to step out in places where you've never stepped before and say, I don't even know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to believe the Holy Spirit's going to fill my mouth and I'm going to speak love and the truth, forgiveness and repentance. God, use me. Could you use some of that Holy Spirit power? Let me say it again. Could you use some Holy Spirit power? Then I want you to show up Wednesday night. I want you to be here Wednesday night. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk on this just a little bit more, and we're going to pray a whole bunch. We're going to worship a whole bunch. We're going to take communion. But this Wednesday night, we're going to gather. We're going to talk more about the baptism with and in the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that. And I want to see you, I see you engage in this. In fact, I want to invite all of our students. We're gonna, I asked Matt if we could bring you in, bring you in, and join us. Now, some of you say, oh, good. Uh, we're we're going to join the old people. I guess I won't come this week. No, come this week. Of all the weeks, I want you to come this Wednesday night. Bring anyone else to save that wants to be baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to just pray. We're going to just pray that in the atmosphere of faith, God's going to baptize us afresh in the Holy Spirit like he did in Acts chapter 2. Now, one more thing. You guys ready for this? In fact, I need you to stand for this one. Boy, this is the message that just keeps going on and on, Scott. You ever going to be done? How many conclusions are you going to have? When he had led them out to the vicinity, I'm in Luke chapter 24, verse 50. How did this conclude? We've been in, we've been, this is the end of a series within a series for about six weeks long here. We've been looking at the crucifixion and um, they got all the way through this. Jesus is hanging out with them for 40 days. Amazing. Hello. What an experience. How did, what do you do now? Verse 50, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Verse 52. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. 
How do we finish up six weeks of, uh, of just close study of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ? How do we finish the, the, the discussion that we've had over the past six weeks of Luke chapter 22 to chapter 24? I'll tell you what we do. We join in with the disciples, and once, once more today, we sing one more song of praise and adoration to the Lord just before we go. Come on, let's sing this together. Come on.